Welcome to this wonderful session. My name is Simon Blake and I'm the chair of Dying Matters. And today we're going to be talking about the loneliness of grief. And to, uh, to join me uh, in this panel are some brilliant uh, guests who are going to introduce themselves um, one by one. So first of all, um, Mike, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm 80 years old. Well, you wouldn't believe it, would you? Uh, I worked till I was 75. I met my wife when I was 15 and she was 16. We were together for 60 years. So she died five years ago. Um, I then gave up work, had an aortic valve implant, a broken leg and a few other bits, but it was very difficult until I got in, in touch with Independent Age, who provided me with two befrienders who have helped me. Thank you very much, Mike, and we we'll look forward to talking more about that later in the panel. Priscilla, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this really um, most needed conversation as part of what, you know, the, the, the festival celebrations. Celebration in a positive way, but sharing what the journey that we've gone through. I think it's a real privilege. I'm Priscilla and Quinty. I come from Cameroon in Africa. I've lived in England most of my adult life. And I shared, you know, the passing of my brother in a book that um, Simon was part of curating. And I'm happy to be here to just, you know, talk about what it feels like caught between two cultures of grieving, you know, coming from Africa and grieving when you're here. I think there's some kind of a, a mix there that I want to bring to the conversation. Thank you very much, Priscilla. Julia. Hi, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I'm a psychotherapist who specializes in grief and an author of two books, Grief Works and This Too Shall Pass. Wonderful, thank you very much, Julia. Annika. Hi everyone, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm Annika Feder, I'm a psychotherapist too, and um, I'm a lecturer at University of Utrecht here in the Netherlands, and I have um, just embarked on the PhD journey, <laughs> and Very I'm nice. doing that on uh, loneliness in bereavement. Mm. Wonderful, mm. thank you Annika. And Marissa? I'm Marissa Nathan Gerson, I'm so glad to be here, I'm, I'm in New Orleans, Louisiana, um, which is a very fascinating place when it comes to grief and ritual. And I just published a book called Forget Prayers, Bring Cake, A Single Woman's Guide to Grieving. And it's a grief guide for sort of the modern age. And I'm really glad to be here. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, you can tell already that this conversation is going to be too short, but fascinating um, while it goes on. And just to say, um, Priscilla, I know that you're going to be finishing, uh, leaving us um, slightly earlier than the rest of the conversation. So I will come to you at the end, but just to give people that heads up um, at the beginning. So can I just um, start us off? And I'm going to uh, just go to Marissa, as you were the last person to speak first, and, and, and the, let's have you as the first person to speak on this. Can you just talk to us a little bit about the topic matter? How do you think grief can lead to loneliness? I think grief innately is lonely because usually it comes when you've lost something. And so the lack of connection innately is what provokes one to feel lonely. Uh, the other part that I'm most intrigued by lately is that when we're grieving, we're changing. And the orientation we have to the world and the way in which we've connected to people and even to our own identity has been thrown into question. And the process of grieving is a recalibration and a refinding of one center after rupturing from another human being or a time or a place. And so for me, the loneliness is twofold. One, that it's painful and that we don't always have the ability and the tools to reach out. Um, also because in isolation, uh, many of us don't have the tools of how to be alone. We weren't taught a solitary life. And three, we're finding, I think it's a very, serious metaphysical process of rediscovering oneself. And that is lonely because when you don't see yourself as you thought you were, you are lost for a period. And the, the exciting part about grief, hopefully, is that you'll refine a center at some point. 
And that's a really interesting point, isn't it? That piece about um, you're changing yourself. And I think we sometimes don't think about that. And I remember when my brother died thinking, oh my goodness, I'm no longer a younger brother. And of course I was, but I didn't feel like I was. And Mike, if I could just go to you, you talked about um, 60 years uh, with your with your wife. Can you just talk yes. to us a little bit about your experience of, of, of grief? Well, I worked till I was 75 and my life was going on nicely and uh, my wife was still here. <clears throat> but before my wife died, obviously my parents had gone, my in-laws had gone, and I'd lost an awful lot of my friends. So my wife was even more important in my life as a, a focus point. Mm. And dealing with her death has been very difficult, especially with pandemic. Mm. Then I had a broken leg. <laughs> I had the aortic valve implant, which was done with a local anesthetic through a tube. But it was great. But getting used to living on my own after 60 years with a partner is difficult. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been good when I've had two befrienders from independent age. And my son has adjusted his work life now. He works for Sky. And he works Monday to Thursday, but he joins me on Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays, uses my office because he's teaching English online as another occupation, but he's here and we'll have meals together. So that all helps me. Yeah. Okay. And just could you just tell us a little bit about the befrienders and what 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 do, what do they do? How often do you see them? I I have uh, eleven o'clock on a Tuesday morning. Isn't it's a telephone conversation at the moment because although she's local, it's difficult with the pandemic, and her husband has uh, some health issues, so I've kept her on the phone. And a lady in Amtill in Bedfordshire rings me at seven o'clock on a Tuesday night. Tuesday morning, my cleaners come in at nine o'clock, so Tuesday's a lovely day. I have lots of activity. Look forward to a Tuesday. Uh, it's a, it's an interesting, isn't it, about how you know, some of it's about actually filling some of some of the time and and feeling you know, to fill some of that time and, and the other parts of it about being alone to process some of the feelings. But Priscilla, just before I move on from this question, I was really interested in your introduction. You talked about being stuck between two cultures and two ways of grieving, and I would just be interested if you just tell us a little bit more about that because obviously there's there's lots of celebration and and, and coming together in, in uh, African cultures around, around the death. You've touched on a very key point, Simon, and listening to Mike about friends and family. I came here as a young person at 2021. I grew up, there's death, you know, your grandparents, your aunties, your cousins, and you get together as, as a group of people and you do, you know, you perform certain rituals, you cry, you do the somersaulting, which you can't do here because your neighbors are going to knock on your door and say you're disturbing the peace. I grew up with that. <laughs> <laughs> then <laughs> in England, it's like you're sedated. You're meant to be quiet in your grief. And I find that extremely, extremely difficult. When my brother died, I kept it inside me. I couldn't scream. I couldn't wail like I would have done back in Africa where I, co I come from. I've watched, you know, relatives die and we can't cry the way we cry back home. And I ended up talking to my GP and ended up with counseling because I held it up inside me. And I find that challenging and I find it difficult. We need to create the space where, yes, I've lived all my adult life in this country. I've got two grown up kids here and my granddaughter is being brought up here. But we need to appreciate that different cultures grieve in different ways and allow that to happen wherever we are in the world. Thank you, Priscilla. Annika, Julia, just be Julia. You have your hand. Well, up. I was just thinking that Patricia has a lot to teach us, you know, that we need to find a way of expressing our grief. Swallowing it down is what causes kind of long-term harm psychologically and physically for people. So, I mean, I love the idea of wailing and doing somersaults. I imagine there's movement, is there dancing and rhythm and yeah. community so that being with your people in a time when you're suffering most, you feel that bodily connection, you feel the emotional connection 
And of course, the grief is painful, but it's not that awful kind of chilly loneliness of, of, in a way, what Mike describes, those six days when you're on your own without your wife for 60 years, is a very different picture. I mean, probably in COVID, everybody has been isolated, which is why it's been so bad. But yeah. I love this idea of the warmth and the movement and music and wailing, which is what we were wired to do. We're wired to express our grief. And that is how we learn to heal. And can I just add something really quick, Simon, please just allow me. I can't help not saying something. Go, I lost, my, my father-in-law passed in 2018. That's the last time I went to my country, Cameroon, because we're having lots of, you know, civil issues and all manner of political situations. For three weeks, or the number of weeks that we were there, the compound, we call it compounds, we don't call it a home or a house, was packed to the rafters. And it's a very, very big compound. People were sleeping on mattresses on the floor. And we got up in the morning, we ate together, we danced, we sang, we did everything. If only I could share those videos with you. To me, that is good grieving and it heals the soul when you do things like that together. When I came back from Cameroon, when I came back after that, I took my children and they were exposed to that way of grieving. And it was, it was healing for, for me, my husband and I. It was very, very healing. And I, I miss that. I miss that. If, if I have to grieve in this country, I've lost people during COVID and I've not been able to do that. And it just hurts. It hurts. Thank you, um, Priscilla. And Marissa, I'm conscious you have your hand up. I, so I will come to you quickly and then I'm going to go to Annika because I'm conscious that we, we've so much to say and so many of us in, in the room. Marissa. I just wanted to tell you that the opening of my book is talking exactly about what we said. I'm just going to read one sentence, which says, it's about my friend in Ethiopia telling me that he got sick when he came to the US when his mom died. And he said, literally, in my country, this is the first part of my book, we scream. In my country, I would yell and let this feeling out of me. I need to scream. I need to wail. But if I wail and scream here, the police are going to come. I cannot release this pain. So I am sick. We need to wail. We need to scream. Mm. And if we can't, we need to find some way to siphon out the pain because grief is everywhere. Thank you, Marissa. It makes the hair sort of stand on the on the back of your uh, back of your neck, doesn't it? Mike, just before you bring you back in, I'm just going to ask Annika for any thoughts just you know, to, to come into the conversation. You're listening and <laughs> hearing and, and yes, obviously you're in a, a, a different culture again. So, so yes, talk to I us. am. I'm actually German, so I'm also uh, in the Netherlands in a different culture, and it's very different between those two countries already. Mm -hmm. um, but I was also listening to Mike and um, doing this, um, yeah, doing my PhD. What I've learned about bereavement and loneliness is that um, we have emotional loneliness and we have social loneliness. And emotional loneliness is when you miss a specific companion you want to share everything with. And I think that is key to why bereavement can feel so lonely because we actually know, oh, I would love to have this meal with this specific person because it's our meal or it's our drink or this is our song. Or then I, I feel uh, in a specific way. And normally I would call my mom. And of course I could also call my sister. I could also call my brother but I want to call my mom and then I feel lonely. So I think there's a, this is really important for um, everyone grieving that, that there is a sense of emotional loneliness. So you can also be surrounded with people and still feel lonely because you do miss that specific companion. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting one, isn't it? And I, I'll come to you, Mike, in, in a moment, but my, my mum um, died and we had her, um, celebration of life fairly recently, a few weeks ago, because she died on December the 31st, um, and we couldn't have a, a you know, funeral, we had restrictions. Um, and in the middle of it, you know, there are all these people that loved her, and the one person who I wanted to be there was mum, because she would have loved it, because they're all there, and, and, and it's that moment where you're just surrounded by people and love, but the, the one bit that you want just isn't, isn't there. Mike, oh, back to you. Yeah, we don't celebrate uh, people's lives after they die in the UK. It's not the way we do it. We don't scream and yell and so on. Maybe there's something to be learned there. 
Yeah. Normally, funerals in the UK are very somber. Uh, we go for a meal afterwards, and it's very quiet. A little bit of humour, but we're pretty dull people when it comes to funerals, <laughs> and that creates it creates grief. I think. Mm. Well, I guess what what is you know the, there's different ways, aren't there? Of, of, of celebrating, there's different ways of expressing. And, and one of those is storytelling, one is wailing and, and yelling. And, and I think the key bit which I've heard people saying is that when it, and, and we all have to understand and respect different ways of doing it, but the bit we mustn't do is suppress the emotion. And for yeah. me, suppression is, 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 is one of the bits where you get, Annika, your sort of bit about the emotional loneliness, you know, when you actually are suppressing and and are not saying the things that need to be said. And when people get nervous that they might upset you if they talk about the thing that's yes. upset you most, rather yes. than you're talking about that. that yes, thing. absolutely right. And I, I'd say we keep on circling around our cultural, cultural background, but I would say it, it, it's also in our culture, it's part of grieving. You should feel alone during the first part. Everyone is expecting you to feel a bit lonely. So... I've also spoken mm. to lots of folks who actually felt gu guilty because during the first period they weren't feeling alone mm. because they, they, you know, they were surrounded by people. So this social loneliness wasn't mm. there. There was a lot of, you know, uh, things to do. But then when the ritual stops, and it might be after a year, then you suddenly feel those uh, this loneliness, and then you feel like you are not doing this grief work right and that you um, are not, yeah, that you are not, um, you feel guilty again because, because you think, okay, I should, by now I should have been done with that. I should have dealt with that. And also my observation is that then also the questions have um, stopped a bit. So people asking whether they um, could do anything for you or whether sh they should stop by and visit, it has stopped a bit. What's then most people need it, um, need it desperately, right? It's, it's, it's really interesting, isn't it? So I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about, you know, I just heard you, Annika, say grief should feel lonely. Marissa, you said it will feel lonely because you're changing your identity and you're missing people. And, and Julia, you talked about you know, wanting to celebrate and Mike, you're, you're wanting to, to celebrate um, people. And there's something, I guess I'm really interested in how our attitudes towards grief might make us lonely rather than grief yeah. um, itself. And I can see Priscilla, you've got your hand up. So I'm going to go to Priscilla, then I'm going to go to Marissa, then Mike, Julia and Annika, just to, to move us around a little bit. So yeah. Priscilla first. I'll be quick. My loneliness was uh, in my head, it was psychological because I was, you know, thousands of miles away from my younger brother when he passed. It hit me when I had to go back to Cameroon and he wasn't there at the airport. He wasn't there to meet me, to hug me. It was a different kind of loneliness. When I was here, my loneliness was thinking about my parents. We are brought up, or I was brought up to believe that parents don't bury their children. And I was so lonely not being there to support my parents because I kept thinking, how are they coping? They'd lost mm. one of my younger siblings long, long time ago. She was whatever age when I was a, a kid. And it's, it's a kind of different positions on that spectrum where you are, whether it's a physical loneliness, emotional loneliness, but it's always there in your psyche. And more so if you have a physical relationship with them which I can imagine, you know, listening to Mike's uh, sharing with us. It's, it's, it's a different kind of loneliness. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you. Marissa. Can you repeat the question? Now I'm confused. I guess it, my, 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 well, say anything you like, really, as long as it's on topic. But my actual question was around um, how um, our beliefs about grief and cultural traditions and norms about grief may create loneliness. And I guess I was thinking very specifically around um, not talking about death, that we don't talk openly about it, you know, that we, um, uh, that, that some, in some cultures, it's literally, uh, we don't know what to say, we say nothing. Great. Uh, in my book, I talk a lot about what we do with 
intercultural grief rituals in different settings. And so there's all these different levels to it. I live in New Orleans. And so a lot of what Priscilla is talking about is present here. We have a very strong tradition rooted in African tradition in the city of second lines and um, having a funeral be um, a dirge and then a dance party um, to raise the soul up. And I'm Jewish and the practices that I was raised with are really strict and you, you know, you have, it, it, I learned that they're very useful. Um, things like sitting for seven days after the burial, checking in at one month, checking in at 11 months, um, saying a daily prayer for a year. And then what I learned, especially during COVID was, and I think it's something that we're all talking about. What do you do when you can't do it the right, the right way? Um, what do you do when you can't say the prayers? What do you do when you can't go home and be at the funeral with the community in a tent and a party? Um, what do you do when what you do have isn't enough? And part of my work is really encouraging people to do more rituals and to do more personal action around grief and grieving. Because if we're waiting for our priest to tell us what's right or the queen to tell us what's right or our rabbi to tell us what's right and we are living in isolation and cannot do that in community anymore and many of us can't and often grievers cannot also in those spaces there's so many beautiful rituals that give us personal power um, so i talk a lot about sort of breaking the rules and making the rules as a way of helping oneself through grief um, whether it be you know one of the examples i gave was this daily prayer you're supposed to say with 10 people in person called Kaddish for a year. And I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. There was no, there, first of all, there weren't 10 Jews where I was to do the prayer every day and we couldn't meet in person anymore. And a friend of mine, when her mother died, translated a line of Italian poetry every single day for a year and giving ourselves markers and rituals, even if we can't go home. And I think part of, at least as a psychiatric and therapeutic tool, like encouraging people to have personal power to create meaning in this moment, because we, um, last thing I'll say, and then I'll stop, is that the other piece that I'm wrestling with here in New Orleans is we just had a pretty terrifying climate uh, disaster. And we are, we are still rebuilding a city that was stopped. I mean, we didn't have anything. We didn't have gas or food or electricity for weeks. And what that looks like is preparing ourselves for a different life that's not normal ever again, probably. And learning how to ebb and flow. And I think the main gift we can give ourselves grieving in this era is personal power to create meaning in new ways so that we're not waiting for someone else's, you know, like a stoic funeral to teach us how to feel when we, we have power now to start to take our lives into our hands. I love the idea of personal power and, and using that to build our own grieving rituals and path, path through. Um, thank you, Mike. Yeah, the point I was going to make is British people are embarrassed to show grief. And if you are the one who's grieving, they, they don't seem to be able to share your emotions. I can understand that. I've not been critical about it, just the way we are. They tend to avoid a situation rather than get involved and talk with you about it. Mike, can I just, while you're talking about that, and obviously we're talking, it's, it's, there's generalisations uh, within any of these conversations now. And, and what yes. I don't want is some, uh, some people to go, well, I'm British and, and I do grieve and, and therefore it's not relevant. There are some generalisations, but just about, about men, about being a man and what you learn around showing emotions. Can you just well, say men don't, we, we don't show our emotions the way women do. And, and, men of your, and men of your age, though, Mike, isn't it? Men of men my of age generation. tend not to show emotions, yes. And, and, um, and, and Some men of your age. I, I think we're, unfortunately, I'm not comfortable with us deciding. I'm talking about Brit men. British men, Marissa. <laughs> no, but even but so, not all I think British it's men. always, yeah, it's always some. It's always some, isn't it? But I think there's a point in here, which is that gender expectations will influence the way that people experience um, grief and and, and grieving, yes. but yes. but I think in in any, in any in any let's let's give ourselves permission. In any generalization here, let's put some in front of in front of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Ju yeah. Julia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Julia, over over to you. I was thinking. I mean, many of the things. I think the power of ritual and why we've used ritual is that grief is invisible, and of course, the feelings of loneliness are invisible, and. 
anyone yeah. who's grieving, you're thrown onto this alien planet where you feel very lost and you don't know yourself, you don't know your present and you're scared of your future. So having a kind of daily ritual that can kind of stabilize you, whether it's a, a, a formal religious one or, as Melissa said, one that you can create for yourself, mm-hmm. is a wonderful stabilizing um, uh, thing to do because a lot of grief feels like fear. It feels like lots of things, every feeling under the sun, you know, from one end of the spectrum to the other. But if we can do things that help us feel safe in our bodies and in our minds and that home is in ourselves, wherever we are, then that gives us a sense of safety within ourselves to support ourselves through the storms of grief as they come through our bodies. And for everybody, that will be unique. Um, You know, some people, the ritual might be going for a walk. For somebody else, it might be cutting flowers. For somebody else, it might be writing a postcard to the person that's died. So many different things. But I think developing external expressions of what they're going through, but also touchstones to the person that has died. So, you know, the person has died, but as you've all clearly shown, the love and relationship with the person that's died is never dies. So the, the love always lives. That's true. Finding yeah. ways, like, like yeah, mm-hmm. you know, your wife is very much present in you and you could ask her a question about, shall I do this or shall I do that? And you'd know the answer. 60 years of your wife embodied in you, you'd know exactly what she'd say. And I've how experienced she'd say that since she died, yes. Yeah. And so it's finding ways of both which you're all talking about very powerfully and I think very um, kind of creatively is finding ways of both expressing and feeling the pain of your grief that is works for you and also finding ways of connecting and remembering the person that's died that can feel comforting as well. Um, but the, the difficulty is that all of that is hidden below ground, whichever country you're in. So in the Cameroons dancing, you externalize it in a way that we recognize it. Or well, here again, your funeral externalizes it. But it's very little and grief is so big and loneliness is so Ooh, big. very big. And 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 just as you were talking, Julia, I was reminded that so my brother died a few years ago, and the bit which I really struggled with was being alive and feeling hopeful. And so actually it was the touch points and all things were very easy, but the hope in the day to day was the important bit. And so you know, the, the, the piece which someone just said to me is, you just gotta wake up in the morning, you've got to think about something that you're happy about, that you're grateful for. And, and I thought at the time, utter twaddle, that wasn't gonna change anything, but it did piece by piece, you know, it, it shifted things to the bit of, of, of creating hope in that moment because grief also um, can take away some of the hope. Yeah, hope hope is it. the alchemy that turns your life around. You need just a tiny flicker that yeah. over mm-hmm. time can grow. Yeah. And you need Annika, to give yourself permission to... for it. Annika, is there anything that you wanted to... Yeah, to... I'm just, when, when Julia is saying something like that, I'm reminded of this German saying, which says, uh, ho- die Hoffnung stirbt zuletzt, which means hope dies, uh, hope is the last one to die. And I do oh, really? absolutely, I always say yeah. that it's, it's so, yeah, to me, it speaks volume. Mm. And I was also thinking because you asked us about, you know, how attitude, attitude to, towards grief may influence how we grieve and also how we look at loneliness. And I feel this is really something we all can learn from and teach our children, teach our friends and families mm. in, in, in saying and then it, that's me again talking about emotional loneliness, that it might be that someone has um, special, especially come to visit you, brought cake, and you still say, I feel so lonely, mm-hmm. right? And I, feel, I think that is something we, we do not want because it doesn't feel polite if you have visitors and someone <laughs> is caring for you to then say, great, mm-hmm. you're here, but I do still feel lonely. And what we, uh, me and my friends do is that whenever someone dies, we invite each, we, we invite each other. We say, um, am I, or I would say to my friend, am I invited 
to uh, along this road road pick dates and just stand in front of your door and be with you however you feel at that moment and so at that very moment the person says yes or no and then from that day on we randomly pick dates and we just show up mm. and so there's I, I think there are ways to 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 um predict what is going to happen right if we look into literature about grief and look into science we know it's going to be a long road so therefore to care for each other and to also predict okay i know this is going to happen you will sit alone and feel alone and just think like oh i don't want to call annika because i just bothered her yesterday or she's busy with the kids or with work and instead of um, making it their decision or our decision when we grieve, we should have people around us who make it, who, who were invited when it was actual, whatever that means in this <laughs> conversation, but when it was still, you know, very normal to be grieving mm -hmm. and then um, process that on. And we really like that as friends uh, with each other. And, and I think that that's a, it's a really important bit, isn't it? The fact that we often don't talk about death means that we don't necessarily get the wisdom um, of sharing the stories and we therefore don't learn that actually, you know, if, you, if you say to me, do you need anything? Well, of course I don't need anything. I'm absolutely yeah. fine. Whereas if we go, we know that you're going to need something and that will include hot food and that will include yeah. somebody washing your clothes and that might include somebody picking up the children or taking yeah. the dog for a walk um, yeah. and so instead of having to say do you need anything you go, we're, we're here we're and wrapping yeah. your arms around and I think there's a very different sort of bit and, and for me I think some of the these conversations can lead us to understanding that shared experience which we all have at different points at different times but we have a shared experience so what did we learn what was helpful and how do we just do it yeah we yeah. do that around babies we yeah. do that around our mitzvah. We do that around you know, christenings and all sorts of things, but we don't do it around death and we, and we could. Um, I'm conscious, Priscilla, you have to go in just a couple of minutes. So I'm going to um, just ask us to um, give you a, a last word and then wish you well to, as you go on your day. If you were going to um, say any of your lessons about supporting yourself through loneliness, about how you embraced the loneliness embraced the grief and moved through it and sat here today smiling you know, able to talk about it and share your stories what would be what would be your your wisdom what would be your wise words to, to people who oh might... lord you always challenge me but thank you so much and i'm sorry i have to rush off to do something else what would be my wisdom do i have any of course you do loads accept it <laughs> and let the pain take its toll through your body. Mm. But accept people who are reaching out and let's not hold back. Let's seek out where we can get some form of comfort from. That is what helped me. Because I held it in, even from my siblings and from my parents, I held it in and that didn't help me. It just didn't help me. When it came out, I felt a lot, lot better, a lot better reach out and get the help that you need. Brilliant. Priscilla, thank you very much for joining us. And you do have wisdom to share. You've just shared it beautifully. <laughs> so thank you very much. I hope that you have a, a good day. Love you all. Take care and have the rest Bye. of the few minutes bye -bye. together. Bye, -bye Priscilla. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Priscilla. Bye. Thank you. Marissa, you had your hand up and Mike, you had your hand up. So Marissa first and then Mike. Right. Yeah. I just was thinking about one of the parts of my book is about uh, figuring out what it is that you need. And I think that for me was the hardest part because I would, for example, recently with this hurricane, you know, we just went through our lives. So you, we had to evacuate and then everything stopped and our job, it was very strange. I've never been through besides COVID anything similar where everything as I knew it was over for a while. And I just kept going like it was normal. And there was a point where, where it wasn't really okay. And I, I don't know that we're trained very well how to recognize when we're not really okay or how to ask for help when we're not okay. I was not able, like all the things that Annika said about, I, I was like, don't ask him for more. Like he's taking care of his wife and kids and don't ask so-and-so and don't 
don't over don't overburden people with this like silly problem you have and so one of the things that i like to encourage people to do is to start to catalog themselves and i really uh, believe in in really working and building a relationship with others but also it's really important that you know even if my friend comes over for an hour a week or three times a week i'm still sitting here with myself and being with yourself can be excruciating so I like to start to catalog the needs, like to sort of play your own parent and look through, okay, well, what would make me feel good and start to indulge that? Cause we don't practice that very much. I don't, you know, even though I wrote the book, I always forget. And then the other thing, just sort of looping backwards a little is that sure waiting, you know, when people visited me, it was great. And sometimes it was hard because sometimes they had, they were a mess and didn't realize what kind of space to give me. But what really comforted me were physical manifestations in my own home, like visual representations of what I was going through. So I started, for example, to have like my dad's photograph and a candle, um, like regularly lighting that candle and doing just little things that made me visually aware of what I was going through or, or just tending the corners, like making, making my bed feel nicer than usual and buying the food that I normally wouldn't buy. And sort of, you know, as we wait, to, as we grieve, like for example, if we grieve the loss of a human being, if we become our own sort of lover in a way, and we, you know, we, we give ourselves oils and we give ourselves mm-hmm. love in a way that we're supposedly waiting for someone else to, what I've found with my work is that women over 70 have been the most receptive, even though I'm in my thirties and writing this and that they're, they're often married, even though it's a single woman's guide saying, oh my gosh, like putting myself first, remembering to take care of me makes it easier in grief, I think most of all. And being able, like that, when you said, oh, and they bring a cake, the cake for me is often more comforting than the person, not because I love sugar so much, but because it's physical evidence that they were thinking about me. So like physical evidence to me is so useful when everything's so ethereal. I think that's a really um, interesting point. So Marissa, I work in mental health in my day job. So, um, and, and what, you know, we, 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 we're not as in tune with ourselves as we could be. And by being in tune with ourselves, we give ourselves permission and we allow ourselves to flop about or we allow ourselves to be you know, super busy for a bit, but we recognise what's, what's going on. So I think it's you know, really important to, you know, in, in usual times in, in, or whatever usual times are, that we learn to understand ourselves and how we can soothe ourselves and how we can comfort. But that bit about you know, evidence that they were thinking of me, I do think from a, you know, we're talking about loneliness and grief, that that feels like you know, one of the biggest things when you just get some ready cooked meals through the post or somebody just turns up and says, you know, do you want to have supper uh, today? Here it is. <laughs> you know, it just feels amazing in those moments. Julie, you have your hand up and then I'll go across to Mike. I love what everyone is saying and, and particularly in regards to Marissa, you know, for all the decades I've worked in grief, one of the kind of most cruel aspects of it is people turn against themselves. So, right, you know, they're feeling the pain mm-hmm. and the missing and longing for the person. And then they somehow think that they're failing because they're suffering. Mm-hmm. And so they punish themselves in lots of different ways. It could be what I call a shitty committee where they kind of tell themselves, you're so useless, get over it, it's been a year, stop making a fuss, all of those different things. Or it could be, you know, they can't bear it. And it's the things that people do to block the pain, drinking alcohol, working super hard, all of those things that, you know, freeze their grief and can lead to psychological disorders that then find themselves with you, Simon, you know, 15% of all psychological disorders come from unresolved grief. And so I think it's such an important message is to know yourself, not distract yourself, and to turn yourself, turn towards yourself with some compassion and love in the same way as you would a friend. And if you do that, you're much more likely to do the things that actually support you and get your needs met and ask for your needs to be met. I mean, I love the idea of people showing up and and offering, but also that isn't going to happen all the time. So finding words or notes or texts to say what your needs are is helpful too. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Mike, you were going to... Yeah. COVID hasn't helped the situation for me because of (laughs) a lot of people who will be visiting me 
can't come. I get phone calls of sort. And after my wife died, I made a point. My local pub's 50 yards away, and the people who are going there I've known for decades. And I was going there each evening just for an hour, not for a bucket of drink, for a couple of hours. We won't judge, Mark. Sorry? We won't judge. (laughs) Because people I've known for years, I've known their families and their kids and so on, and we'd have a good hour's chat. And they're all people who went in fairly early in the evening and went early, we went early. And that did me the world of good, that. Mm -hmm. So I've got to start doing that again soon. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, it's finding the things that work, isn't it? Annika? I wanted to just add that because Julia said that that a lot of the mental health problems um, may arise from um, unresolved grief and that with the study I did, we also found that actually loneliness may serve as a gateway symptom um, for that. So loneliness and grief kind of kind of um, has this chain reaction almost. And that, that's also why mm. I think um, all of the, mm. these points about self-care mm. um, and knowing what you need to feel happy and less lonely, mm. um, or maybe I shouldn't say happy and less lonely, just less lonely, because mm. it might be neutral and less lonely. Mm. Mm. Um, th- these are so important uh, to, to have. And um, uh, Marissa, you also said kind of, Re, uh, reparenting myself and and I, that's actually a, a psychological term and technique to reparent mm. yourself to, mm. so you're doing quite well there mm. <laughs> and I the think thing, that's one of the things we need yeah so we've talked a lot today generically around grief and there are obviously different experiences whether that's younger people whether that's older people whether that's people from a marginalized group uh, LGBT um, Q people people that are estranged from their families is there any thoughts which any of the panelists would want to just add in relation to any specific uh, uh, points or thoughts about grief, loneliness, help that those groups might want to, that you might want to just to add in? Julia. I mean, you, you've said it really, the, the marginalised groups, the LGBTQ plus communities and the young people are very vulnerable already and highly likely to have higher rates of anxiety and mental health issues before they were bereaved. And then when they get hit by a bereavement, that would be a kind of a, a massive thing for them to have to deal with when they're vulnerable already. Um, and often what I found with young people is that they don't legitimize their grief. They somehow think they shouldn't you know, if it's their sibling that actually that's died, it's because the parents are the one that should be grieving or if their friend, it's not, they're not a family member mm. and they then don't get the support they need and don't access it. Mm. So, I mean, I think they are a particular group we need to pay attention to, to make sure they do, that we go to yeah. them, those in, in the field to meet their needs so that they don't um, suffer more. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Marissa, did you want to add to that? The concept of compounded grief is so relevant to communities that are already dealing with the grief of um, prejudice and at times violence or estrangement from family or just wrestling with identity. And then on top of that, the grief of loss. And so the recognition of all of those griefs is to me often very useful. And Just like finding a grief group can be very helpful. I think talking to other queer people, being an LGBTQ community, reaching out. I mean, in my experience, um, especially in in the trans community that I'm adjacent to, people are always welcome if you want to speak and if you want to write them and say, I want, I need support. It's not a closed space. It's a very different um, way. And so inviting young people to, to, even follow people on Instagram who are like them. And especially when you're grieving to reinforce these other parts of the self that also need witness. And I I just believe in witness as like the most powerful healing measure. So if someone feels invisible, finding a space where they will be visible and helping construct that is is so deeply useful in this time. And and I I just listening and, and, and reflecting, and I guess there's something, it's very easy, isn't it, to talk about dying without talking about living. And one of the things which I, so my brother died unexpectedly and quickly at 45 and my mum, we had 
four months since diagnosis before dying. And with my mum, we were, yeah, it was more in the natural cycle. Yeah, so obviously it was too early. She was still only 75, but, um, you know, it was, it was you, know, you expect that um, and, and, and you don't, yeah, with, with the brother and, and similarly then with their son. But we were able to do lots of the things that you do in grief with my mum. So we did a memory book. So the things that you would often say at funerals, we said and did when she was alive. And we got the chance to tell the stories and to make sure that we understood, um, you know, the things which have been important and the things which weren't important. So I guess um, for me, there's just something this in recognising that it's not only letting out your emotions and not suppressing them when somebody's died. It's making sure that in life that we live the life with the love. Um, and, you know, and of course, there will always be complicated relationships, both before and after death. So I don't want to undermine those. But where you can to express the love and to, to feel that love and to ensure it's there, because I my personal experience anyway, um, and it, is that it was much easier having had the opportunity to, to do certain things and to, to do some things that need to sometimes be dealt with in grief to deal with them. Yeah. In, when somebody um, in my case, my mum. Was living and I guess from it would be interested um, uh, just as we um, as we I guess start drawing to a close to get your sort of if you had your one top tip what would it be and I would just start by saying you know it let's let's do the conversations when people are alive as much as we are able to let's live with that freedom of emotion in order that we can also do the same when we're when when we experience bereavement um, if we're if we're able to. Um, but having conversations, whatever those conversations are, talking about death in our, with the people we love, with the, in our communities, has to be a really important part of, of dealing with the, the inevitable. You know, you've talked about the inevitability of loneliness during grief, the inevitability of pain, um, and that we, we want to accept that. So, um, so, Julia, can I come to you first? If you were to give some advice about how to help ourselves um, and I know that there, you've, you've written plenty for people who want a more in-depth um, sort of bit. I read some of your, your, your work uh, myself. Um, but um, what, what would your top tip be uh, in terms of, of, of helping people to think about managing grief, thinking about loneliness? I, I think, you know, when someone you love dies, the thing that matters most is your love and connection to others and that you find love with others. And that will include feeling lonely when you're with people and a longing to have that kind of soul connection with the person that's died. But when we're grieving, we need people and our path in grief needs to be paved with people. Thank you. Thank mm. you, Julia. Mike. Well, I'm determined now to get out and about a lot more. I've had a broken leg and also I've had to have cataract surgery. So I couldn't drive for a while. I've just had that now so I can get back in my car and do things when there are things happening. But I, I, I've been a member of U3A for a while and that all went dead for, for 18 months. It's starting to open up again. So I, I'm determined to get out and about a lot more. Okay. So for you, getting out and about is an important way of connecting. So what Julia is saying about you're connecting, finding the love with people and things um, as well. Well, I spent my whole career was contact with people. I was a sales manager for many years. Then I had my own business. And after I retired, I was persuaded to go work for my niece's company doing views on uh, houses they were selling. I did that for seven years. So I didn't retire. I was 75. So all the time I had contact with people. Hmm. I learned about them. And when you're showing people houses, they tell you the life story. And in selling, I was in different towns every day. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you, Mike. Um, Annika. Yeah. I, I was thinking along like mm. one, one <laughs> advice. Wow. Um, I think uh, in grief, as well as in all the feelings that we have, it's, uh, to me, it's always feel your feels um, and do not be polite, but rather be honest. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Andrew. I would agree totally with that, yes. Marissa. 
Uh, I think my big advice would be to buy my book. I'm going to like do a little plug. This is, <laughs> it's, it's fun to have. It's beautiful. And it has, it's literally just a guide to being alone. And mm. I, um, you know, when I, after my father, I moved to New Orleans. That's what the book is about. I moved here. My dad got sick a week after I got here and I didn't know anyone. I was taking this big risk. And then he died two months later. And I'll tell you that Mike, I also hurt my leg. I had right after my father died, I tore my ACL and my meniscus and couldn't walk for uh, most of the pandemic, like origin pandemic. Yeah. And what, what I really think is so important and I'm surprised I'm saying this so bluntly, but it's just creativity. That's it. Like, I think that the more we encourage people to write or to draw or to create or to put on a costume or to play around, I mean, you don't need a friend for that. And you don't, we, there, there's an element to our lives that we are just more solitary in this era we're in for a moment. And I, I would say my easiest moments in my grief were when I was creating and when I was because I could see like you, you just need to take it out from inside. And if we can't scream and we can't wail and we can't go to a second line, I mean, New Orleans doesn't know what to do without a jazz funeral because that's how we process grief. So what do you do? You, you make, you, you create, like you take it out of your body. And I, I think move, there's just, you, it doesn't matter who you are, how old you are. Um, you could turn on a song, like Mike could turn on music and start moving. Um, and the other thing I just want to plug is, grief groups are unreal. They, they are the most useful thing. And the part, the point in my path where I went to a grief group was when I started to feel crazy. Like all the advice I want to give is great, but at the end of the day, I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to make art. I didn't want to light the candle. I didn't want to eat the cake. And that's when I found groups. And when you're isolated at home, there's things, I don't know if the dinner party reaches the UK, but the dinner party is this group that allows you to literally just go on Zoom to someone's house and talk about death together and it's and life together. It was for me so deeply nourishing when I was isolated to just be able to even on a screen, look at others and say, Oh my gosh, I'm not alone. Um, and my friends couldn't do that. I needed it to be others who were my friends who were going through loss could do it. But most of my friends weren't the ones it was people in grief groups that really helped me. I just say I've learned a lot today, actually, uh, <laughs> from other people's opinions and, uh, I think it's been very useful for me. Mm. And I think we should have sessions again sometime. And I think, Mike, this is the point, isn't it, really? Uh, that, that by talking about grief, by talking about um, our experiences and shared experiences, because there is, you know, there's, there are some certainties. We'll be born, we'll live and we'll die. Whatever the time frames you know, are between being born and dying, there are shared experiences. Mm. And, and by talking about them, we exactly as you to use Marissa's word, we bear witness to them, we make them real, we legitimize them and we help to console um, one another through, through understanding that. So I guess that's probably a very good place for us to end, take it from Mike, that by talking about it, we learn and it's helpful. Um, and that if there's anything that, um, that I would be taking away from this is yet again, yeah, that, that that experience of sharing, of learning, of listening with compassion, um, listening with the intent to hear one another and to yeah. to, to really understand um, is incredibly powerful at any time and then particularly at times of grief. So Mike, Julia, Annika, Marissa, thank you very much for being part of this panel and really appreciate all of your time.